Look at all the fathers this morning. Fathers that break their backs for their family. They sacrifice themselves and their lives. It's a wonderful thing. This morning we want to talk about the father and what he does for his children. When my wife became pregnant, I just want to tell a quick story. When, when Laura was pregnant, we made an appointment with the OB, the obstetrician. The first thing, she pulls out the monitor and she checks the heartbeat. Five, six weeks into it, the baby's heart is beating. We were there at three months and the baby's heart, boom, 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 boom. That's the first thing you check when you walk in. And uh, <clears throat> as we got closer to the due date, we visited the doctor more and more and more and w a week, every week. First it was every month, then every two weeks, then every month, every week. And, uh, and then labor came and that was just an awful experience for Lara. Me, I you know, I was just, I was just kicking back. And uh, she had the baby after a bloody mess, and it's just, it's just an interesting experience. I'm not going to say it's like the best thing in the whole world, because it's just pretty nuts, all right? It's crazy. It's the best thing in the whole world. And, uh, you know, I got to hold the leg, and everyone's like, oh, gosh. Praise God. Anyway, at the end of it all, I, had, I got a little emotional with both of my kids, because... I was just glad they came out okay. <laughs> after all that, after all of the nine months of are they okay or this or that, you know, complications, are they turned the right way, you know, uh, is it breached, is it this, is it that, you know, it could be all these things, or it could be a miscarriage. Ah! Finally, at birth, the baby's okay. Praise God. So, they give you a picture like this, and there, there it is, baby in the womb. And of course, you know, the TV shows, they explain it. You, you kids over here, the teenagers, just, you just have no idea unless you're there seeing it all happen. Babies don't come out clean. They're all messy and ugly. You know, Beckham had the cord wrapped around his neck when he came out. He was blue. I was like, who is this kid? And I was like, is that supposed to happen? You know, in my mind, I'm at, oh, he's like, oh, it's boo, it's, uh, it's baby blue, you know, it's okay. You know, he was trying to brush it off, of course, the, you know, come on. But really, when it comes down to it, a baby, the, the, the thing that you care about, they really only have two options. They're either going to be born and live, or they're going to die. I mean, it's awful. But really, the only option for that baby in the womb is to come out. Or the other option is that they're going to die. And it's the same way in the spiritual realm. Jesus said in John 3, 3, Except a man be born again. Everybody say that. Born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And we've got to understand that for a lot of people... In America and in the world, they're in a state of inside the womb. They've been conceived, they're being formed. You see, some people, when God's word comes, it triggers something in their spiritual man. When they hear the word, it triggers a conception. And they begin to grow. And, if, and people, as they keep getting reached by the church, they begin to grow. And the church does their job to continue that growth process. And finally, when they decide to accept Christ, it doesn't, it doesn't have to take nine months like it does with, you know, natural pregnancy. But it takes time. And finally, when that person accepts Christ and invites him into her life, accepts the blood on the cross and all those things, God comes and he births them. We've got to understand those who have not been birthed, those who don't know Christ, there's only... Two options. We are going to live with our Father in heaven, or we are going to go and die and go in the lake of fire. And it's a horrible thing, just like in the natural world. It's a horrible thing when a, a baby dies. 
It's awful. And no, and God doesn't want any babies dying. He doesn't want any of the people in the world going to hell. But it's a, it's a choice. It, it, it happens when we don't accept Him and let Him birth us. Accept a man, and this says it really well, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And of course, we know the Bible says that all have sinned. This morning, if you have not accepted Christ, you've got to understand that all have sinned. The payment for your sin is death. Jesus Christ is the only one that has the power to pay for your sin. He's the only one that went down into hell, and hell couldn't stand Him. Hell had to kick Him out and say, Get out of here! You don't belong here. The devil, when Jesus came down, uh, I have no accusations. When all these other people came before the, the judgment seat, the devil had accusations, but not Jesus. He's the only one. And of course, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us. The Father, like I said, He brings that word and He starts that conception. And the mother of the church, you know, Mr. Kinster, or the preacher is so right these last couple of Sundays. You know, he's been encouraging us that one of the responsibilities of the church is to reach people with the word. You know, when you look at the husband and, and wife relationship, they birth children. And it's a sacrifice. My, Laura, you know, any, any person that's had a baby, it's a sacrifice. You've got to carry around this thing everywhere you go. You have to eat. You've got to be careful what you do. At night, you're going to be up all night doing this and that. And all. Oh, I don't want to get into that. But there's a sacrifice in having a child. Just bearing a child. And it's hard, but the church, we got to sacrifice our time for the people out there. We got to reach them with God's word. We got to reach them with the gospel. We got to find people that are willing to be born. This morning we want to look at uh, the story of how Israel was de delivered out of Egypt. And uh, we're going to look at three things. Israel meets the Savior. It exp he, they experience salvation. And the last hindrance that they face. In Exodus chapter 1 verse 16, Pharaoh commands the midwives to kill, murder all the baby boys upon delivery. Now we just talked about how a baby was in the womb and has to be born. That's good. They've accepted Christ. And now we're at a stage where they are babies. They've already been born. It's verse 17, the midwives let the boys live because they feared God. And you see, we've got to understand here that this story is talking about Satan, he's after new believers. He's after new Christians. If you've just accepted Christ, he does not want you to make it. He does not want you to continue in your growth with Jesus Christ. And the midwives didn't listen because they feared God, the Bible says. And it's not that they respected God. You've got to understand that Pharaoh, he had authority in Egypt. He could take people's lives away. With, with one word, he could say, kill that woman. She's not listening. Put her in jail. He could have made their lives a living hell. But it says they feared. And if you look at that word, it's talking about the terror. And you see, the terror of God came on these women. And they said, we're not doing nothing. Because God said, don't touch my baby boys. And that's very powerful because Jesus Christ, the Father, He will keep Satan from harming you. Satan doesn't have any power. The Father is above Satan. Amen? So Satan comes and he accuses, he discourages, he condemns. You notice that Pharaoh never went and did it himself. He had the midwives do it. They didn't listen, so he commanded the children of Israel to kill their children. I'm not going to get into that. So Satan comes and he accuses, discourages, and condemns. And new Christians, what can we do? What defense do we have 
against Satan. Well, first of all, the Father's going to protect, protect you. But as a baby, you've got to keep growing. You've got to drink the milk. And we know the milk of the Bible talks about the milk of the Word, the basic understanding. If you've been a new Christian, you've got to go and read the Gospels and find out about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You can read Genesis. It's a great story. You read those things. That's the milk of the Word. Getting saved, faith, believing in God. You, we've got we've to take that in. We've got to drink it. And of course, we lean on the church. We've got to come to church. Jesus said it was His custom. It was His normal, every week activity. It was, it was something He did all the time. It was a habit to be in the house of God on Sundays. You know, we always hear that verse quoted, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves, even more so until you see the day approaching. And everybody's heard that scripture. And everybody I tell that to, I've heard that scripture, but I have an excuse for that. Well, what about Jesus' custom? Jesus was in the house of God. And we need to be here at church. It's important. Christina, she's pregnant. She needs your help. She's sacrificing her time for the, her, her child and the church and the school and, and. Amen? The Bible says that every joint supplies. Amen? We can all help. We can all be a part. And of course, a baby, they can cry really well. They cry really loud. You know, when, I, when my kids were born, they cry, and I'd come, and you know, I'd hold them. Oh, okay, what's wrong? And, you, know, you bounce them a certain way. You know, they got dad wrapped around their finger. But that's okay, especially when they're babies. And of course, we know in Psalms 8, 2, it says that out of the mouths of babies, I'm sorry, children and infants, I have ordained praise to still the enemy and the avenger, to freeze, to stop the enemy and the avenger, to destroy. This word means more than that. So every week when we come to church, there's no sitting down. There's no, you know, we got to stand, we got to praise, we got to reach. As a new believer, I was always praising God. I was, may have been messing up, but when it was Friday night, I would come into the service and I would praise and sing and with all of my heart. I didn't care who was next to me, my friends or anything. And that helped me in my life. And my family knows when we went home, I would sing songs and I would drive them nuts singing songs. And as I wanted to lift up the name of Jesus, or, you know, there was just joy in it. You know, who wants to be sad? You know, get the joy of the Lord. Get the songs of... Praise Him. Amen? And we come in Sunday morning, we need Him. And we want to exalt Him. Our Father, He deserves so much praise. Amen? You know, we can say a lot about our fathers and praise them and lift them up, but... God, our Father, He deserves so much more. <clears throat> when I get home after working, long day, you know, go in early, the kids don't see me. I come home late, it's about 7.30. I walk in, and Lara's like this. And uh, Beckham and Brooklyn are, Yay! And uh, Lara, you know, for the, to the kids, she's just, you know, she's old news, okay? She's chopped liver. And Dad's there. I want to be with Dad. I want to jump on him. I want to hug him. And I want to... Amen? Amen? And they get my attention. When I come to the door, you know, they don't... I, I try, I'm trying to put stuff down. I'm just trying to walk around. And they're just in my legs and all over. They're... They're saying, I want to be with you. Amen. And we've got to be that way with God. We've got we've to stop Him. We've got we've to get in His way. We've got to say, hey, I want to be with Hey, hey, I'm here. I'm here. You know, when I walk in, they don't just go in another room.
And when we come into God's house and we lift up His name, it may be embarrassing. You know, that's the great thing about kids. You know, Brooklyn and Br- they don't care. You know, Beckham, he could have a pink shoe on. He doesn't care. You know, he could have, his hair is just a mess. And, just, and he doesn't care. Hey, Dad, I'm here. I'm your son. They don't care. And, uh, you know, being a teenager, I know how it is. You get up here and you start praising. You just care about everything around you. And you just got to get rid of it. And as an adult, I'm sure we got cares. We got worries. But you got to put them aside. Amen? And we want to move to our next topic. Israel experiences salvation. So before... They're experiencing the Savior. And we get saved. We accept Christ and He saves us. He saves us from Satan. Satan doesn't have any power. In every, all these stages, Satan is defeated. So we don't walk around saying, Satan's got me. Satan's got a hold of me. No, He doesn't got a hold of you. He doesn't have a hold of you in the baby stage. He doesn't have a hold of you in any stage. He can only accuse. He can only discourage. He can only try to get people to mess with you. And salvation, salvation, when you hear salvation, it means deliverance. And salvation is not just accepting Christ. And we want to learn that this morning. You see those babies in the last one, both of them being born, that's salvation. Being saved from Satan, that's salvation. And we need, I'm sorry, there it is. Salvation is deliverance. And as you know, Israel, they were slaves of Egypt. And in Exodus 1.11 it says, So they set over taskmasters to oppress. To oppress them with, everybody say burdens. Burdens. So they were slaves of Egypt. They had jobs to do that they always had to, you know, these guys would make sure they, they would do them. They'd get out there with their whips and say, You better comply and of course, in Hebrews 12:1, we find that it says, "Let us throw off everything that hinders, all unnecessary weight, all the burdens, and the sin that so easily entangles us." So these these taskmasters, this this enslaving, being in bondage to Egypt, it's sin having a hold over our lives. And you see, sin will correct you. Sin is going to hurt you. Sin is going to whip you. Sin is going to require a consequence. It's going to... There's a consequence for that sin. And for you young people that are here, you've got to understand, everything you do, the choices you make, there is going to be a consequence. In Galatians 5, verse 1, it says, Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. This is in Galatians. This is the New Testament. Talking about don't be entangled with the yoke of bondage again. The yoke of sin. Sin, you know, a yoke is something that is tied to two things. You're, you're here and sin is here. Sin is going to put you through the ringer. Amen? When you have sex outside of marriage and that person, you know, gets pregnant or that person... It's going to put you through the ringer. When you, if you decide to kill that child or that person decides to have a baby and she's not a great mom, and you, you know, sin is going to have an effect. And if Christians would read these stories in, in Exodus and read it with some understanding, you know, you would see here there's no, there's no, there's no room for sin in your life. You know, God is not trying to put sin into us. He's not saying it's okay for sin to keep being put into you. He wants to get it out of us. He wants us to be free from sin. Exodus 1.11 again. It says that they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, pit home and Ramses. And you've got to understand here, Pharaoh is part of a different kingdom. He's not part of the kingdom of God. And here you have the children of Israel enslaved by 
In our terms, it's by sin. And they're building whose kingdom? Pharaoh's kingdom. You see, when you're enslaved to sin, you're not building the kingdom of God. You are supporting, you're building the kingdom of darkness. Two cities. That's, that's important. For these people that we've got excuses that sin is okay, that, you know, it's okay that I have sin in my life. Yeah, that's true, but you need to get out of it. Because right now in your state, you are supporting, you are going against God. If God, if you're not for me, you're against me. In Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, speaking of himself, he's talking to Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. You know, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Everything's built on Him. I will build my church. Like I just said, God's building a kingdom. God's building a church. He's building the kingdom of God. We need to be on His side. And sin, entangling yourself with sin, you're not going to be building the kingdom of God. And I know a lot of you here, these are all basics. But we need to be reminded. Exodus 1.14 They made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar, brick, and all kinds of work in the field. You see, sin makes you bitter. And uh, I'm going to stretch out and say, you know, the word also means undrinkable. Bitter water. Not fresh. Not good. You see, you started out fresh water. You started out drinkable when you were born, in, in to G, born again. And then you became bitter because sin came. And made you bitter. You see, we got to get it out. And this is important because your loved ones, the people around you, the people closest to you, are going to partake, have to partake of you. When I come home, my kids partake of my character. They partake of my relationship. And if I am bitter, if I'm undrinkable, when they get old, you know, they're going to grow up. And they're going to copy the things that I do. No matter if they want to or not, they're gonna, it's just in them. When they're around their dad and mom, they're going to copy the things we do. And when they're older, they have to decide, is that something that I should be doing? Is that something that I have to reject? And you don't want your children to have to grow up and decide, I can't be like dad. Amen? We don't want to have undrinkable parts in our lives. In Exodus 1.14, in all their hard labor, the, Egyptian, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. And like I said, sin is going to put you through the ringer. Sin is hard work. It's the hard life, as we've been taught. Sin, the sinful road, is a hard life. And there's a father who's made a way. Sin is not going to stop until... It's put you through the ringer. In Exodus 12, 13, they said, uh, Moses told the congregation, I'm sorry, the Lord told Moses to tell the congregation, take a lamb. So at this stage, here they are, they've been born again, and here they are, sin still has a hold in their lives. And the answer is, take a lamb, take a bunch of hyssop, Dip it into the blood, into the basin, put some of the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame. Put the blood all over you. Get God's blood to have its perfect work in your lives. Don't stop going to the cross. Continue. Say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I, I'm going to be in your house. I'm going to be calling on you. I'm going to be getting your blood to get forgiveness and deliverance. The blood can deliver us. The blood has power. The blood just not only saves us, it delivers us. Amen? And when they applied the blood, we know that the death angel came to, Israel, to Egypt. And every place that had the blood of Christ, the death angel passed over. And it says it, that happened at midnight. And a cry rose out because of all the deaths. There was not one house where there wasn't a death. 
And Pharaoh got up in the nighttime and he said, you guys need to go. It wasn't like three days later. It wasn't a week later. It was now. You guys got to get out of here. We can't handle you anymore. The kingdom of darkness, see, that's one of the problems that we don't want to face. Our friends. That's very, it's very difficult. When friends don't decide to follow Christ, when friends want to continue serving the kingdom of darkness, they're going to ask you to leave. Or they're not going to show, associate with you anymore. And it's a price. It's a cost that we have to pay. And they had to leave Egypt. This place where it was such a great city. It was such a beautiful city. Of course, now that God had, you know, He had kind of messed it up a little bit. It wasn't so great now. But again, it says in the Scriptures that followers of Pharaoh... We're thrusting them out, the Bible says. They're pushing them out, saying, you need to go. But, in Exodus 12, 32, it, they, it says that they took the flock, their flocks, they took their herds. You know, they, they used to belong to Pharaoh. Now they belong to themselves. They got to keep them. They took them with them. In verse 35, the Egyptians gave them gold and silver and precious jewels and clothing. The Egyptians gave them whatever they needed for the journey. You see, there are rewards in serving Christ. You know, God's going to give you what you need to serve Christ. I remember the first, when I came to my boss, I was being interviewed. And uh, I had worked there for six months as an intern, just, you know, $12 an hour, that's better than nothing. And uh, I was interning, and about six months into it, you know, at first I asked, how can I get more hours? She said, you know, you got to be a shining star. And I was like, well, okay, I can do that. So I would be there early. I would be answering emails. You know, that yeah, email would come in. I'd be writing an email, right back, answer, answer. And pretty soon people knew who I was, and I... Six months into it, she called me in and said, we're going to offer you a job. I said, all right. You know, God is making a way. And God's you know, presence came on me right there. And they wanted to give me a lot of money. I was like, what? You guys? I thought I had to go somewhere else. You know, I didn't understand how it all worked. You know, I'm a newbie. I'm 19. She calls me in. We'll give you a job. I'm like, okay. I'll take it. And I was able to get all my needs met. And I've been working there and, you know, been able to provide for my family. You know, God's been meeting my needs. And we want to leave that life of sin. And I, God wants to bless your life. And in verse 38, it says, A mixed multitude went up also with them. You see, some people were convinced that God was the one to follow. You see, that deliverance, the blood, you know, when it came and all that what God did in their, in their land convinced people. And you see, God wants to convince people. God wants to convince people when you can overcome sin, when you become a different person, He's trying to get other people to serve Him and follow Him. Amen? And the biggest best thing that all these people did, 600,000 and a mixed multitude, they went out and they began to follow the cloud, follow the pillar of fire, follow Moses as Moses was following the cloud. And you see, you may not be an excellent Christian, but you're following Jesus Christ. And that is key. Amen? Exodus 14, 13. We know that they followed that cloud. They followed it down to the ocean. And we know that they started to complain, saying, Do you, What's wrong with you, Moses? You brought us out here to kill us? As soon as they saw the Pharaoh army, they, they started saying, What are you doing? 
And Moses replies and he says, The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Satan's influence over their lives was, they're ne you're never going to see it again. He's not going to have influence over you anymore. He's not going to have any hold at, over you at all. You're going to be completely delivered. And God destroyed the armies of Pharaoh. We know that story. He parted the Red Sea. The Israelites walked through it. The armies followed them. And the Red Sea closed up on the armies. In Luke 10, 19, the Bible says, Behold, I give you power to tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all. Everybody say all. All the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen? There's no power in the kingdom of darkness that can overcome the power of Jesus Christ. He has the power to deliver us from sin. And the last hindrance, if any of you guys have read Exodus and Genesis, which I'm sure you have, you know that it wasn't Egypt anymore that was the problem. In Exodus 16, 2, the whole community started to grumble against Moses and Aaron. And this is because they didn't have water for a couple days. Then they started to complain. And Exodus... Not just complain. You see, complaining is when you say you know, you're, you're not happy with something. They began to say, they began to judge Moses. Say, why have you done this? What are you thinking? They began to judge God. God, you know, you're wrong in doing this. And see, that's a big problem. You can't do that. Exodus 6.13, you know, when you go around the church and you start accusing people when you've got problems in your own life. Amen? Amen. See, that's, that's a big deal. When we want to improve something, that's one thing. But when we want to sit there and accuse and demand that judgment be cast on somebody, you better be sure that you're not doing some, something in an area that's similar. Amen. Exodus 16, verse 3. We, have, we used to have pots of meat and all, ate all the food we want. We come out here and there's nothing. Of course, they have the flocks and the herds. I don't know what happened to them. Maybe they're just exaggerating. We don't do that. So God provided the manna. God said, this is the finest wheat. I'm going to give you the best wheat there is. And how many know at this church we get the best word of God that I've ever heard? It's an excellent word. And it says in Numbers, same story, 11 verse 4, The mixed multitude that was among them fell lusting. The children of Israel wept again and said, who shall give us meat to eat? And it says later on, all we, they were saying, all we have is this manna. You know, I don't want this manna. They were unsatisfied with what God was providing. They wanted to taste it. You know, like Paul today, he made my Father's Day burrito with steak, man. That was good. And yeah, we like variety, but, you know... From, from the time they were delivered to the time it took them to get to the promised land, it was less than a year. Come on, you can handle anything for a short time. You don't have to complain. You don't have to curse God. You don't have to accuse Him. That's stupid. And they began to say, we remember the fish that we did eat in Egypt freely. Of course, they're dead now because the, the lake was, or the river was blood. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. There's nothing at all besides this manna. You see, it's our flesh. Satan has no hold over us anymore. And we come out there and, and, and things aren't 
always rosy posy. In the wilderness, things aren't rosy posy. You don't have a nice bed to sleep on. You don't have a wonderful house. They had to sleep in a tent. Situations were a little difficult. And there's going to be a time in your Christian walk where situations aren't going to be great. And the flesh is going to want to say, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to go back to what we did before. And it has nothing to do with Satan. It's our flesh. So we need deliverance from our flesh. And Christ has the power to do that too. You see, He has the power to deliver us from Satan, from, from enemies, from all these things, and our flesh. And He's got the power. He doesn't just save you from hell. He has the power. Of, uh, well, let's continue. Another hindrance, emotions. Exodus 32, verse 1, The people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto them, Up, get up, make us gods. And the reasoning behind this was because they said, We don't know where Mo this man Moses is. This man who brought... You know, of course, they, they distanced themselves from him. This man, this man, you know, he was their family, he was part of the Levites. Oh, this man... That church, I don't want to go to that church. That church is just, I don't know what's going on with them. That pastor, you know, we distance ourselves, so then we just, boom, hit him. And they, they got concerned and worried, and they were unsure and uncertain, and all these emotions were flooding them, so they decided to change things. Go up and make us gods. So Aaron just says, okay, give me your gold and I'll make you a god. And he made a calf. I mean, hello, what is he thinking? And they were living it up again, dancing, stripping naked. Yeah, you read it. Drinking, partying, worshiping the idol. Here God had just parted the Red Sea. I don't understand that. They walked through the ocean. The army is destroyed. None of them were killed. I mean, come on, talk about the timing there. Come on. And you're just going to follow the mixed multitude to worship gods because they had gods in Egypt, so they want to, you know, seek a friend. Whatever the people want, no! See, Moses, I'm sorry, Aaron, he made the God and he said, tomorrow we're going to have a feast to the Lord. You see, he was trying to mix. He was trying to mix in the Lord and sin. He was trying to mix in wrong teaching, stuff that was just totally wrong. You don't worship idols. And he was trying to mix in God and the Lord. And you see, a lot of people are doing that today. They're mixing in their own message with the message of Christ. And it's very conflicting. It's very confusing. It's just like Saul. If you remember the story, when he really... When, he, when God confronted him, he confronted him because... He decided to sacrifice before Samuel got there. He took things into his own hands. He said, uh, there's, you know, Samuel's not here, there's a delay. So I'm going to go outside of the pattern and do it my own way. I'm going to make up my own standard. I'm going to make up my own way of doing it, and I'm going to follow that. You see, you can't do that. You can't just start serving idols. You can't just start going outside of the pattern. We got to keep following the pattern. We can't mix in our own patterns with God's pattern. And of course, God had taken them all this way to the promised land. And we know that an evil report came in Numbers 13:32 regarding the promised land. 10 of the 12 that came back, brought an evil report. Of course, Joshua and Caleb said, no, you guys are totally wrong. 
And the people began to fear. They wept all night. Oh my gosh! And they started to say, let us make a captain and go back to Egypt. Because they were afraid. And we've been challenged to reach people with the gospel. And I'll tell you, I'm afraid. But we can't, you can't turn back. There's people that need to be reached. There's an enemy that needs to be destroyed. They were afraid of the the giants. They were afraid of the people. They didn't want to confront them. And we have to confront the kingdom of darkness. We have to confront that influential kingdom of darkness. And you see, these people totally turned and said, I'm going to go back to sin. I'm going to go back to the slavery. I don't want to build the kingdom of God. I want to build the kingdom of darkness. And you don't say it like that. Of course, people don't say, I'm going to serve Satan. People don't say, I'm going to serve the kingdom of darkness. They just say, I'm going to go back. And all the congregation said to stone Joshua and Caleb. You see, here, you know, maybe at this point, when they wept all night, you know, maybe they could call on God right there and say, God, explain this to us. God, help us. You know, Maybe right there, they could have still went into the promised land. Maybe the threat even, when they said, let us make a captain and return to you. You know, just the threat. <sighs> but you see, right here, all the congregation said to stone Joshua and Caleb. God showed up and He said, get out of here. He, he judged them. He, he was going to wipe them out. He, he just, he couldn't stand that. In Jonah chapter 2 verse 9, it says the salvation is of the Lord. And you see, we need to be saved. We need deliverance from Satan. We need deliverance from sin and its hold in our lives. And we need deliverance from our fears our flesh, our emotions. You know, those emotions, you know, it's not bad to have emotions, but when your emotions cause you to do things that are wrong, against God's Word, against your family, you got a problem. And you see, salvation, deliverance, is from Jesus Christ. 